وَإِن تَعْجَبْ فَعَجَبُ قَوْلُهُمْ أَيْذَا كُنَّا تُرَابًا أَيْنَا لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ الْأَغْلَالُ فِي أَعْنَاقِهِمْ وَأُولَئِكَ أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the Hot Seat Podcast. Once again, I'm joined by Ustad Muhammad Tim Humble and Ustad Abdul Rahman Hassan. How are you guys doing today? Very well. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khairan. Well, yeah. Jazakallah khairan for joining me once again. Again, we have a topic that is related to the world of unseen. I'm going to get straight into it. Um, it's going to be talking about magic. So let me begin by asking you a very similar question to what I began with last time. What exactly is magic and what does Islam say about it? Okay. Right. So I think uh, perhaps we can start linguistically that magic is what, or it is said about magic, that which it's something which its cause is concealed or difficult to perceive, something that happens which is in opposition to normal, you know, the norms or normal, the norms of the universe or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and it happens for a reason which is hidden. And difficult to perceive So if we've understood that That's I think important uh, linguistically Because later on It explains why the word magic Can be used for Things which go outside Of the core Islamic definition uh, Things like uh, Eloquent speech and so on And things like that So that kind of linguistic basis Is a good place to start In terms of the uh, technical definition, again, I personally think that it's useful to look at or it's very beneficial to look at the Qur'an and to look at what the Qur'an says about magic and perhaps one of the most comprehensive ayat is the 102nd ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah Azza wa Jalla said وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَتْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانُ وَمَا كَفَرَ سُلَيْمَانُ وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرَ وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِ لَهَارُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ حَتَّى يَقُولَا إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِّينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنِ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ وَلَبِئْسَ مَا شَرَوْا بِهِ أَنفُسَهُمْ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ From here we can take certain things about magic from an Islamic point of view. First of all, we want to establish that magic is something as it's defined in the ayah, it is ilmun yuta'allam. It is so, a, so, sorry, just give us an overview, general overview of the ayah. We, we're going to come to it. Don't okay. worry. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just, instead of translating the whole ayah from beginning to end, I'm going to select elements of the ayah that I want okay. to focus on for the point of view of defining magic in Islamic context. The first thing is that we have ilmun yuta'allam. That it's an, it is a, a, a knowledge which is learnt. It's not something somebody is born uh, with or, or something which just you know comes like that. It's something. فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ They learnt minhuma from those two. So here we have something which is we have something which is learnt. We are told by Allah Azza wa Jalla that the magic referred to in the ayah here is kufr. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنِ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقٍ That the one who purchases it will not have in the year after any share. We are told that it is harmful and it doesn't benefit. They learn what harms them and what doesn't benefit them. And we're told that it is something which has real effects. That there is something which has it has real and uh, and significant effects because they learn from them that which by which they separate between a man. And between his wife And that is something real And not something uh, imaginary so As an outcome Like the outcome is, is a real outcome That is something real That they by, by this They separate from this Between a man and his wife And we learned that The effects of it Only happen by the permission Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And his decree 
وما هم بضارين به من أحد إلا بإذن الله شيخ النوي فهد سم بوينتس تأر عن الآية نعم إن شاء الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد um, when we look at the Quran and the Sunnah uh, we look at the definition of the word sihir we tend to find that it revolves around ne- nearly four meaning um, it revolves around four main meanings the first one the Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad mashallah mentioned it and that is kullu amrin yakhfa sababuhu wa yutakhayyalu ala ghayri haqiqatihi it is anything which its reason behind it is actually hidden for us it's what we are now going to be talking about real actual magic and Allah mentioned that in the Quran he says qala uh, alqaw فلما ألقوا سحر أعين الناس واسترهبوهم وجاءوا بسحر عظيم. Um, this is the issue of Musa عليه السلام and the magicians. So they threw their their magic and فلما ألقوا when they threw it uh, سحر أعين الناس. They actually came with something a magic. So I just want to I just want to touch on that. So سحر أعين الناس. So they bewitched like the eyes of the people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So to me, does that not seem like it's almost like an illusion, not something real? It's not made it, and also Allah says, "Wa yuqayilu ilayhi min sikhlihim." So it's made to appear mm-hmm. to him. So what we do is, um, the magic is two, uh, four, these four meanings. The first one is that it's actual, literal, real magic, uh, something that really happens. And the Sheikh he brought the ayah, "Yuallimun um, al-nas al-sihra." Ibn Abu Abdullah al-Qurtubi says, "Yuallimun al-nas al-sihra." You can't teach what is not reality. The fact that it can be something taught, it's that something that has a reality to it. Like you can teach someone to do sleight of hand. So that's the second meaning that it has for you. But, but I'm, I'm still trying to stay on the first one because I'm not really convinced. I, th- I think perhaps if we go through those mm. those four meanings, okay. and then maybe from there what we can do is we can branch out into specifics of each one, inshallah. Yeah, so the second meaning that it revolves around, and inshallah I, I do, because the f- first one is actually what we're going to be discussing and yeah. has it actually even happened and... Uh, is this a difference of opinion and what are the arguments that they've brought you for? The second meaning is that uh, the word sihir is uh, And this is the one that you're referring to, which is that uh, it's just that the person doesn't really understand what's taking place right now. They just can't see it. Uh, trick of the hand. Uh, it's what the Arabs would say, sabi, uh, I deceived him. Okay. And this is one of the ones that the scholars put into the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that in eloquency is uh, magic. Um, that's the one they put it in. I'm a, بَلْ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ مَسْحُورُونَ A مَخْدُوعُونَ They mean, we're, we're, we're people who've been deceived. Um, the third meaning that it has in the Quran is that is azur wal kadib lying and deception. And that's where Allah says, وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ هَذَا سِحْرٌ هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ Sorry. وَقَالَ الْكَافِرُونَ The disbelievers, they said, هَذَا سَاحِرٌ كَذَّابٌ Here, سَاحِر, they mean uh, a deceptive individual, uh, one who's making up things, who's forging things. And the fourth one is الْجُنُونَ so, Someone's a lunatic, crazy. Mm. And that's the one Allah uses in Surah Isra, where he says, فَقَالَ لَهُ فِرْعَوْنُ إِنِّي لَأَظُنُّكَ يَا مُوسَى مَسْحُورًا Here he means مَسْحُورًا أَيْ مَجْنُونًا Musa, I actually see you as a crazy person. You're not fine, you're not normal. So what we ha- what we have to do is, and this is a principle in our in our religion, is um, we have to really understand the verse that we're using, the type of sihr that is used. Okay, I agree. لأن الحكم يدور لأن الحكم على شيء فرع عن تصوره. In order to place a ruling on something, we have to really perceive the definition of this particular word. Is it? We both have, both have to agree on that this word is actually the one that we're referring to here. Um, the verses like this Was it used by the people of the Ahlul Sunnah Did they use it in that regard Who were the party of, Who were the people that used it in this situation So let's make our conversation mm. easy And say that we both agree or All three of us will agree That there is such thing as sleight of hand And the tricks Which is the second one you mentioned mm-hmm. And there's also deception and lying mm-hmm. And there's also insanity So that out of the three of the four you mentioned I don't think there's any dispute Between the three of us mm-hmm. That they exist Sorry. And that they're a reality. The one I suppose where we should probably revolve the rest of our conversation around is this thing where magic, uh, you call it a reality, like real I magic. What do you mean by could, that? We can stop there for a, for a moment on something you said there about the three of us agreeing those things to be reality. I think we should also agree 
that all of them could be termed sihr linguistically. Okay. That all of them, the word sihr linguistically, could be used to refer to any one of those things. And if that's the case, then the issue we have here is we're dealing with a word that can be used in more than one way. So it's important that what, we, what we're trying to establish here is whenever we talk about a particular nas, a text, an ayah, hadith, what is the, or, or an, an event like slate of hand, what is this, what, what are we actually talking about here? What is the, what's the reality of what we're talking about here? Because we know, and that's a principle in Islam, that names don't change the reality of things. I can, you know, somebody can be playing with cards and call it sihr, but that doesn't change the reality and the hukum of what that issue is, is that that person is, is moving their hands around with cards. So I feel that's an important point here, that this is a word that has, that has a broad usage linguistically and can be used in a very wide context. And so whenever we start to talk about it, we need to be very specific about what we're talking about because there's no doubt that what we talked about in Surah Al-Baqarah in the 102nd ayah is not card tricks. So what I will say is that before I, I can agree to that, I definitely agree that the word sihr can be used for the, the last three categories and it can be used in any of those three categories. Okay. I can't agree it, it can be used for the first because I'm yet to believe or yet to be proved that that actually exists in the first place. That is... That real magic that you guys are talking about. Real magic. Like, yeah. Previously, what we did was, first of all, let's understand that when we speak about haqiqat al-sihri, to do tahrir al niza to actually get to the point of contention and discussion to be more fruitful, you have to understand what we're differing on. You're saying that the four types of um, meanings of sihr, uh, three of them, there's no problem. I three of them are it. So it's the one that you actually have a difference or you differ with us on right now is whether the actual magic can really take place, that something can happen like that, which happened at the time of uh, Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam, for instance. At the time of Nabi Allah Musa alayhi salam, we already discussed yukhayilu ilayhi for me that both of them indicate it falls into the seconds it's more deception deceiving okay, the eyes of the hand. so let me explain something to you um, first of all the issue of sihr actually really taking place actually happening is a mas'ala and we've always mentioned this the source that we take our religion from is the Quran and it's also the Sunnah and also the consensus we discussed that uh, last time and yeah. we've also agreed that that is our premise for every every time that we have a difference these yeah. are the places we take it to Allah says, وَمَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ There is not an issue you differ upon except the ruling is with Allah. So it's either through the Qur'an or it's through the Sunnah or it's through the consensus. Okay. So, uh, Imam Abu Ma'ali al-Jwaini, rahimahullah, Abd al-Malik ibn Yusuf, Abd al-Malik ibn Abdullah ibn Yusuf al-Jwaini, uh, Imam al-Haramain, they call him. He mentions, he says, وَاتَّفَقَ الْفُقَهَاءَ عَلَى وُجُودِ السِّحْرِ that the fuqaha, meaning Ahlul Sunnah, the people who hold on to the Sunnah, they unanimously agree upon that um, the fuqaha and Ahlul Sunnah, sorry, all agree that the sihr is present. Which, what did he mean by that? It could I'm going to break it down now for you. Okay. So the aqwal of the ulama in haqiqat al sihr is two views. The views of, if we loosely use the word ulama, is two types. The first one is Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah on one side who say that the magic is a, has a reality, it does exist, it has to, it is present. Rather, some of them, uh, they even went as far as saying that this wasn't something that even the previous uh, Arabs, the previous, uh, the, the Jahiliyyah, they didn't even differ with it, they knew it. Umam, the previous nations had to affirm this, that magic did exist. And in our religion, the Quranic discourse, the Sunnah, all of it affirmed it, and consensus. For example, let me bring you some consensus that was transmitted. Uh, by Al Khattabi, he said, "A sihr thabitun, wa haqiqatuhu mawjudatun." Sihr is present, and its real uh, sihr is present uh, is affirmed, established. Wa haqiqatuhu mawjuda, and its reality is present. It tafaqa akthar al umami min al Arab. The overwhelming majority of the Arabs agreed, such as wal Furasi, wal Hindi, wa baad al Rumi ala ithbati. That's what he said. And then he used the evidence from the Quran and the Sunnah because we know the qaida is kalam ulama yuhtajula wa la yuhtaju biha. The statement of the scholars are not a proof in and within in and within itself. They require an evidence. Even though he transmitted a consensus here. But he used the ayah yu'allimun al-nasa as-sihra. 
he also used the ayah ومن شر ومن شر النفاثات في العقد and he said وورد في ذلك عن رسول الله أخبار لا ينكرها إلا من أنكر العيان والضرورة وفرع الفقه فيما يلزم الساحر من العقوبة وما لا أصل لو لا يبلغ هذا المبلغ في الشهرة والاستفاضة the sunnah if we look at it and what took place, well, if we look at the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, all of them are going to mention it, inshallah ta'ala. He says, and the akhbar and the narrations that have come, la yunkiruha, no one rejects it. Uh, and no one rejects it. Even if a person was to look at the reality in front of him right now, what's taking place and what's what's happening. Qarafi rahimullah also transmitted a consensus. No we transmitted the consensus. Ibn Qudama transmitted a consensus. Ibn Qayyim rahimullah, he transmitted in his kitab, Bada'il Fawaid. A consensus. That's the first view. The second view is those who said that there is no magic. It doesn't exist. Which this is, is within Ahlul Sunnah? No. We're going to mention okay. them. There are some people who we wouldn't take them out of Ahlul Sunnah who did kind of go. But this view is Qawlu Ammatil Mu'tazila. It's the view of the overwhelming majority of the Mu'tazila. And those who agreed with him, like Abu Bakr al Razi al Hanafi, who is really well known as Al Jassas. Uh, he and Abis Haq, uh, Al Astrabidi, Rahimahullah, and also uh, Ibn Hazm. They're the ones who've taken this opinion that there is no such a thing as magic and they rejected it. Like in Qurtubi, Rahimahullah, he's the one who said, he said, Wada haba ta amatul mu'tazilati wa abu shaq al isra wa abu wa abu wa abu ishaq min ashab al shafi'i ila anna al sihra la haqiqa talahu wa inna ma huwa tamwihun, as you mentioned, wa taqeelun. وَإِهَامٌ لِكَوْنِ الشَّيْءِ عَلَىٰ غَيْرِ مَا هُوَ وَأَنَّهُ ضَرْبٌ مِنَ الْخِفَّةِ وَالشَّحْوَذَةِ All it is is just uh, illusion and everything. So this is an opinion that you're mentioning now. It's important to mention where it stems from, where it's come from. And all the arguments that you're going to bring or what you're going to bring forth is an opinion held by the Mu'tazila. It's not what Ahlul Sunnah hold um, and a view that they push. And I just mentioned to you those who've said that it is. Then inshallah I'm going to bring the evidences. Uh, as, it, as we go along, inshallah. The, do the Mu'tazila believe that Allah is one? Uh, they, yeah, they're, they're Muslims. So they can be in right in certain things, right? Um, but for your view to go in line with the Mu'tazila and then go against Ahlul Sunnah in their in totality. I feel like every time we speak, I mean, it happened on the Jinn episode as well, it just comes back to the, my scholars have said this. But this I, is, I mean, this uh, is Ijma'a. You I, can't I, go it's not one this. or two. If it was one or two or three or scholars, then I personally would, say to you, we would have said to you, then maybe, you know, let's look into it even more deeper. But I'm saying to here to you that Ahlul Sunnah, they all unanimously agree on one opinion. Not to mention that the Sikhr mentioned here, I know they're saying the Haqqiqatuhu is, is reality. Is that not talking about the reality of sleight of hand? It can happen. The reality of insanity, it can happen. Why do you always, I'm, I, I feel like you've added this first category that I'm yet to agree on, and I'm not even sure if it exists or not. I'm going to let. Mm. He has something I to think say. when when we look at what these some of these scholars and we've heard some of the quotes, it's it's very telling the way they describe the call of the Mu'tazila, the words they use to describe the call of the Mu'tazila. They describe the opinion of the Mu'tazila as being the opinion that magic is nothing more than illusion. That by, if we look at the reverse understanding indicates to us that according to Ahlul Sunnah, it's more than just illusion. They use the word haqaiq or haqiqa. Mm-hmm. It's reality. It's something that really exists. It's not, it's not something that's just illusion. So I see here that even in the way that the ijma' is being conveyed to us, there is within that an indication of what the two sides, the opinion that the two sides take. That's right. And ultimately, you can't take a position... And then when, when you look at who took that position alongside you, you don't find anyone among Ahlul Sunnah who took that position. You find that the, the only people taking that position are the Mu'tazila and those who followed them from you know, particular individuals who either uh, were from them or either people who you know, sort of followed along. But Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, their belief is that magic is a reality and magic is not merely illusion. And those two, when you take them together, exclude the fact that their meaning of magic was was the illusion that you're referring to. I hope that there's, makes sense. That there's, makes sense. there's something I also want to add to it. Shalom, I'm going to bring the evidence as well for, for uh, the view. But I just want to un- put something in context. And, and I really want this to be understood. Some people think that the Mu'tazila looked at the Quran and they looked at the Sunnah. And they came up with a conclusion different to Ahlul Sunnah. And that's not what happened. 
Okay. It's very important to be understood. Sheikh Al Islam Taymiyyah in his Kitab Bayan Mujmal Utaqadi Ahl Sunnah, he really elaborated on this point, which is they came to a conclusion. These people, they've already reached a conclusion. And once they've now met their conclusion and they felt this is what they believe, then they went to the Quran and they've tried to force those verses to go in line with what they believe. And this is where the scholars they say, Ya Atakiduna, Thumma Yastadiluna, Fayadiluna. They believe in something and they affirm it. There's a preconceived notion. That's what they believe. And then they look for the evidence. And then when the evidence comes to them, they turn the neck of that evidence, they break the neck of that evidence, they push that evidence away, they shove that evidence to the side. Everything has to be in line with what they okay, what is it that you they're using as a premise and that they use a akal? It just does not make logically make sense to us. And so now the Nusus al Wahyain is gonna have to go in line with what I've already affirmed. So I this is is different from a person who read the Quran, read the Sunnah, and did not see this proof in the Quran and the Sunnah. It's totally different. You see? So you tend to find some of the ulama may reach a conclusion with a deviated group sometimes. But they read the Quran. They read the Sunnah. And they felt that this was the right way. But whereas the Mubtadi'ah, like the Mu'tazil and others, they reach this conclusion all based upon a preconceived notion prior to reading the Quran or the Sunnah. Rather, their, their relationship with the Quran and the Sunnah is very low. Very, very low. Okay, so let me give you some evidences, inshallah. Yes, ta'ala. please. And prove to you that this is something that number one is a consensus, and uh, we I've, I've I've said this to you before. If there is a consensus, there is no need to go to the Quran and the Sunnah. And you proved that in the Jinn episode. Yeah, I did. I said Allah Tabarak wa Taala says, "Ya iladin amun alti Allah wa alti al Rasul wa uli al Amri minkum. Fa in tanazatum fi shayin faruduhu ila Allah wa al Rasul in kuntum minuna billah wal yom nakh." If you don't agree with one another in an issue and there is a difference, then go back to the Quran and the Sunnah. But if we all agree on an issue, that a consensus is a proof now. That's it. But even then, even then, yeah. I'm just... To the consensus it. must be built of something from the, from the yeah, text, no right? doubt. This ayah is a mahalu shahid for this point, And it proves the adilla of those who say, Ahlu Sunnah, which is, فَيَتَعَلَمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْءِ وَزَوْجِهِ This is not tahayyul. So, so in English that means? So they are teaching. Yeah. فَيَتَعَلَمُونَ or they're learning. مِنْهُمَا مَا They teach or they learn. Yeah. Dividing between a man and his wife. I know people nowadays that can, that can learn that. They can start learn how to tell tales, learn how to gossip, learn how to maybe even um, uh, entice another man's wife. There's, mm. there's plenty of ways of doing that without so actually step back magic. Right? Let's, take a, let's take a step back. You said previously that the magic is... Uh, Takhil, meaning it's not just, just takhil, it's also deception and lies. I remember the three things we said. Okay, so a deception, lying, uh, you know. So deception, lying is one. Takhil is like uh, uh, illusions. Illusions is another one. And the third one was in, kind of like insanity. So, okay, my question to you that you won't be able to answer right now in this verse is that فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ كَذِبْ and iftira and zur is not something human needs to learn. It's a default position you for the can, human. You can learn it. You can learn how to how to lie you can learn how to become a better liar you can learn how to so would the would the verse not be, would it not would it not have been better for the ayah if we look at it why would it use specifically magic here to divide between a wife and his a wife and a husband because it could have been a combination of all thro- three of those things mm-hmm. that we agree mm-hmm. on and it's easier just to use sihr. see that's the issue now you've taken a verse and you've explained it on your own interpretation. Okay? Let me give you a hadith that explains the ayah. That okay. gives an explanation of the ayah. Um, Al Imam Muslim narrated in his Sahih in Hadith Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anu qala qala rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna Iblis yada'u arshahu. Iblis places his throne ala al ma'i on the water. Thumma yab'atu sarayahu. Then he sends his delegation. Mm-hmm. No, he sends his men. And fa'adnahum minhu manzilatan a'adamuhum fitnatan. The person that the shaitan brings closest is who? The Which one. one is it? It's the one that causes the greatest mm-hmm. trial and tribulation. Mm-hmm. One of them will come and he will say, kada wa kada. I did this, this, this to him. And then he will say to him, Ma You really haven't done anything. And then another one comes. Ma I never left the two, meaning the wife and the husband. I made these two leave each other. 
So Shaitan is involved this one. Mm. It's not just the issue of lying. Shaitan is involved. And the ayah clearly shows that as well. Yeah. So Shaitan here is the one that's dividing them. And we mentioned in our previous ep- episode that the jinns within them that are believers and then within them that are shayateen. And the relationship, inshallah ta'ala, as the episode unravels, inshallah ta'ala, we'll speak more about the relationship between the jinn and the sihan and how it, that works. But here what we learned, an additional information, additional evidence that we learned is that it's not lying. It's a hadith. Why? Because the Prophet Sallallahu told us in this hadith that the shaytan sent these two people. Now let's look at what the scholars took from that. Like for example, look at for example, Mujahid ibn Jabrin, a great imam. Ikrimah, Hassan al-Basri, Qatada, Bahak. All of them they said, يعني السواحر. This hadith, they looked at it, they contemplated over it. These are the people of the language. Again, people. Mm. But so great, uh, like, like just share, I, I, had a, I had it at a point. But even your, your view, like, I just I have yeah, to put this clear. On, please. Even your view that you're pushing forward, yeah. they're a view by a people. Lesser in degree and less it's, incompetent it's, compared it's to It's two things. It's a, it's a view by the people. It's a view by the reality of what we can see around us. Oh, no, reality. We Honestly, the reality does show us magic. We see people who are... Who are Magic has been done to them, and it's not an issue of delusion. I think. I think more than that. Um, there, I, I first of all, the first question that came into my mind when you were, when you were putting forward your argument there was, what if it's lying? What is the reason why Allah Azza wa Jalla terms it to be kufr and says that the person will have no share in the hereafter? Mm. Because we know that lying, broadly speaking, is a major sin. And the belief of Ahl Sunnah is that major sins don't take you outside of Islam. And uh, furthermore, for Allah Azawajal to use such a severe term, you know, not only to mention the word kufr, but to say, وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا لَمَنِ اشْتَرَاهُ مَا لَهُ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنْ خَلَاقِ This person will not have anything in the hereafter for lying, mm-hmm. for spreading gossip. Every one of us who lies, malahu fil min and he will have nothing in the hereafter. This indicates that there is something going on here that is m- far greater than simply lying, and that is the use and the, the, the that is the worship of other than Allah Azza wa Jalla through the use of the shayateen in order to cause uh, to cause separation between husband and wife, as mentioned in the ayah. There's another point that we talked about reality. We don't just see sihr from the reality of the mas'hur. We also see it well established and documented in books written by magicians, people who practice magic, telling the way that they practiced it. So I think it's unfair to say that we just see this person who's unwell and then we say, oh, this is sihr. We also have thousands and thousands and thousands of manuscripts, of books, of documentation that talks about sihr from the point of view of the people who practice it. Of so, the kuffar who are practicing it. Of, of course, for the person who fil min khalaq, whether he claims to be a Muslim or not, but also written in Arabic by people who claimed to be Muslims. No, that here the issue I wanted to, to highlight here is not to trust, not in trusting them, but in being uh, fair in saying that magic is not the, the reason that or or the this idea that what we see with our own eyes is simply that we see some people who are unwell and then we label them as having uh, as being afflicted by magic that's not true we also see people who say that they practice magic from people who attribute themselves to islam and people who don't we see books written on how to practice magic from people who attribute themselves to islam and those who don't so it's not fair to say that, that the reality that we witness is just a reality of some sick people that we just labeled them as, as being magicians or as being, sorry, as being afflicted by magic. So I think that has to be said to be fair in terms of talking about what we witness with our own eyes. Also, uh, there's a point I want to build on, sure. on, what, on what the Sheikh mentioned is that the ayah, you know, uh, we tend to see that what you mentioned about the issue of lying. Allah told us that the default position of the humans So the insan, Banu Adam, zulm and oppression, oppression is a form of lying, khada. Okay. They will use all forms to oppress someone. So it's not something we generally have to craft and learn. Oppression, uh, is, it, is it part of the fitrah? That everyone is born. Yeah, some actually, yeah, some scholars actually say that the human, 
the way Allah created him when he came into this world is that he's oppressive and he's ignorant. And until he gets rid of those two traits with uh, certainty and patience, he will remain like that. You tend to see those traits come out sometimes when the person is... So it doesn't... For the eye to emphasize that they're learning magic. At least we can agree that you can learn to get better at these kind of things. And there's still a learning process to get better. I mean, but I, I did but there is there is that still the issue. We still have to explain how it is that a person can learn to lie and then become a kafir yeah. who has no share in the hereafter. I want I want to um uh, I want to pick up on that. Um, it's a very valid point. One question that I do have is that this ayah is talking about Malakain, two angels. And we know Allah says uh, about the angels, I think Sheikh Abdul Rahman mentioned it in the last podcast with the regime, uh, with the jinn. Um, لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. Are we now saying that Allah is commanding angels to teach kufr? How do we understand this? So I think it's important first of all to say that the scholars of tafsir were not unanimous in saying that they were angels that were sent. But the key thing here is not whether they were angels or not. The key thing here is in the statement, إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ فِتْنَةٌ فَلَا تَكْفُرْ Whether they were angels or whether they were uh, sent by Allah as a, as a trial and a test, they said, we are nothing more than a test. So do not disbelieve. And that is absolutely key here, is that if you look at the ayah from the story of the shayateen, وَاتَّبَعُ مَا تَذْرُ الشَّيَاطِينَ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ the shayateen were those who disobeyed in this regard. They were told, this is a test, it's a trial, don't learn this. That's a nasiha. And the nasiha was given, the message was given, don't learn this, we are a trial. After that, the shayateen are those who took that, uh, that information and took that knowledge and, mis and, and used it in order to break between a husband and his wife and those who followed them from the shayateen in the wal jinn. But the key thing here is that advice We are nothing more than a trial So do not disbelieve Just another thought that just, just came into my mind on that That Why can't it be the case that Actually these These two angels were to, who are, uh, There's a khilaf between it But these were actually teaching Lying, deception like I said in the first point and the reason why they're saying we're a trial, don't disagree. You're not going to leave that lying in the session, are you? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Really, I'll tell you why. Hold, hold on to it. Like, this is actually in response, like this actually this in response to the kufr bit of the ayah that you mentioned as well. In response to that, why can't it be the case that these, uh, they're actually saying that don't Learning think this is, is magic. Kufr. Don't mm. think this is actually magic. Don't think this is real magic. If you did that, you'd be disbelieving. Don't th it doesn't exist. Don't think that. <laughs> don't disbelieve. <laughs> okay. We're just lying. We're just deceiving. Uh, first of all, my first response is, did anyone before you ever say that in the history of... I'm not sure. I, can't, I don't know, but I don't okay. know. So I think that one might be a one that you took from your pocket, to be honest okay. with you. And <laughs> the second thing that, that comes to my mind is I still don't see how l learning something, learning how to lie or learning how to spread gossip is is according to the principles of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah an act of disbelief? I think that needs an that needs an evidence for it. We need to bring an evidence for that. Okay, Salaf Khan, do you have any more evidences for magic in the Quran and the Sunnah? Yeah, there is. Um, the ayah Allah Tabarak wa Taala, wa min sharri nafa thati fil uqad. The ijma of the Mufassirin, the consensus of the Mufassirin, is that this is a sababu nuzul. It came down regarding a situation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The magic that was done to him by Labid ibn al-Asam That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Magic was done on him I thought this event took place in Medina And this was a Mecca surah According to Iqlama and Ata and Hassan al-Basri But they don't you, They all unanimously agree that this ayah Is referring to that incident The question of when it happened and when it took place Could be differed upon La shak. Um, what is a Mecca and what is a Medini? By the way, the concept of Mecca and Medini is a mas'ala that goes back to um, uh, Nuzul al-Qur'ani, the Qur'an descending. We've took this in more length when we were explaining the kitab uh, al tafsir min kitab al nuqaya by Jalaluddin al -Suyuti. The concept of what is Mecca and Medini is actually not uh, unanimously agreed upon. Some of the scholars, when they said Mecca and Medini, they were referring to ma qabla al-hijrati wa ma ba'd al-hijra. That the Mecca is what, what came down before Mecca, uh, sorry, before they went to Medina. Mm -hmm. 
and Medini is what came down after Medina. They went to Medina uh, after, or after the Hijrah. And the Mecca is before the Hijrah. And a group of scholars, they said, no, Mecca is only what came down in Mecca. So whatever came in Ta'if is not considered to be part of Mecca. And whatever came down in uh, Fath Mecca, in Mecca, is considered to be Mecca, not a Medani Surah. So the definition of what is Mecca and Medani is not, by the way, a unanimously agreed upon definition. That's number one. Secondly, is that they all unanimously agree on the Mufassirin, Kulluhum, that this ayah, uh, it came down and on the Prophet ﷺ issued the magic that was done to him. All of the Mufassirin. And the hadith is uh, found in uh, Bukhari and it's also found in Muslim. Uh, it's the two most authentic sources that we hold on to as Muslims. So give us a summary Sunni. of the hadith. So the hadith is um, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, Sahara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rajulun. A man placed magic on the, pro- on the Prophet ﷺ. This man, by the way, is from the people of Bani Zuraiq, Labid ibn al-Asam. Yuqalu lahu Labid ibn al-Asam. Not only do we know that the magic was done on the Prophet, we know who did it on him, alayhi wa sallam. Hatta kana Rasulullah yukhayyalu ilayhi. Until the Prophet ﷺ started to see things. Things were happening to him. He was seeing things. So remember, the, it wasn't... Uh, uh, somebody was doing something to him and he was seeing it differently. Okay. Like the whole situation around him, Ali Sallallahu Alaihi was um, mainly a couple of things in his life, sorry, mainly specific things were becoming, mm. he was seeing it in a particular way, m- specific things, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And no, kana yaf'alu shay'a wa ma fa'alu. And what it was is that um, he would think he did something when he really didn't do it. Sahih. حَتَّى إِذَا كَانَ ذَاتَ يَوْمٍ أَوْ ذَاتَ لَيْلَةٍ وَهُوَ عِنْدِي Aish said, until one day he was with me. Okay. Uh, again, this shows us it's something that took place in Medina because it's Aish رضي الله عنه situation. She said, لَكِنَّهُ دَعَى وَلَكِنَّهُ She said, but دَعَى وَدَعَى He made dua and he made dua. ثُمَّ قَالَ He then said, يَا عَيْشَةُ أَشَعَرْتِ Did you feel أَنَّ اللَّهَ أَفْتَانِ فِي مَا اسْتَفْتَيْتُهُ فيه Atani Rajulani, a man, two men. Do you not see Aisha that Allah gave me a ifta, that which I asked me? And Allah gave me a response to what I asked Him for. فقعد أحدهما عند رأسي one man sat next to my head, والآخر عند رجلي and another one sat next to my leg. Because after my dua, Allah accepted it. Two men came now, one sat on my head and one sat on my leg. فقال أحدهما لصاحبه and then the both of them started to converse and speak with one another. One of them sat at the head of the Prophet and another one on his leg. So they both conversed and spoke to one another. What's the illness of this man? Oh, what's the illness? So one said, he's matbubun. And he said, he's an ill, sick man. I, uh, the English terms are, mm-hmm. are not accurate for me. I mean, this man, is magic has been placed on him. And then he said to him, who is the one who afflicted with him this? فَقَالَ لَبِيدُ مِنُ الْعَصَمُ قَالَ فِي أَيِّ شَيْءٍ وَأَيْ إِشُّوْ قَالَ فِي مُشْطٍ From a uh, comb of the Prophet ﷺ وَمُشَاطَةٍ Comb that the Prophet ﷺ used. وَأَيْنَ هُوَ Where is it right now? He said, قَالَ فِي بِئْرِ It's present in a well called ذَرْوَان فَأَتَاهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ سَفِي نَاسٍ مِنْ أَصْحَابِهِ فَجَاءَ فَقَالَ يَا عَيْشَةَ كَأَنَّمَا أَهَا نُقَاعَةٌ حِنَاءٍ أَوْ كَأَنَّ رُؤُوسُ نَخْلَهَا رُؤُوسُ الشَّيَاطِينِ قلت يا رسول الله أفلا, أفلا, استخرجت أفلا استخرجته قال قد عافاني الله فكريت أن أوثر على الناس فيه شر شرا فأمر بها فدني فدفينت If you can explain it more So when he said to Aisha رضي الله عنها that it is in the well of one and described this place like we do again the, like the rules of shayateen and it's like this how the, how this place was Aisha said did you not take it out O messenger of Allah the Prophet وسلم, said as for me Allah has cured me from it now here the scholars differed over whether the Prophet وسلم, took it out and they differed Considerably over this Because the riwayat are different Some of them mentioned that he took it out Some of them mentioned that he didn't take it out But the general response was Regardless of that That Allah Azza wa Jal Cured me From it He gave me a cure from it 
and I was fearful that it would cause a harm to the people. Some of the scholars mentioned that the people might learn how this is done and do it to others. Or some of them mentioned that it might itself, it contains a harm in it, that the harm from it may spread to other people. So this is like a comb with the hair of the Prophet and the hair tied into the comb in, in knots. And this is the well-known uh, hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha. So some of the scholars mentioned that he took it out, but he didn't. He didn't open it. He didn't open it up fully. And some of them mentioned that the the stronger opinion is that he took it out because the the, the narrators are, have are, their memorization was stronger. And others mentioned that he didn't. But the, that point is a minor point because the rest of the story matches completely. The issue is that she said to him, "Did you not take it out, O Messenger of Allah?" Sallallahu And he replied, "As for me, Allah has cured me. Afani in some narrations, Shafani. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has." Given me shifa and Allah has given me afia. So here, 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 okay. the, shaykh, the last word he used was the word shifa. Abu Abdullah al Qurtubi, the great Mufassir, he said, Wa shifa in the Mayakunu bi rafil illati wa zawali al Maradi, Fadella ala anna lahu haqqan wa haqiqatan. The issue of cure, it comes from a sickness and an illness that befallen a person. And a removal of an illness indicates that this is a reality. And, and just on the issue Sheikh you mentioned On the issue of the word Matbub uh, This word Tab uh, here uh, The scholars mentioned That it's a kind It's a specific kind of It's a khas Min a sihr It's a kind It's more specific As a specific type of Of sihr But the word is used for The word is used for sihr uh, And they, they showed about how The Prophet Sallallahu Was different Because not every kind of sihr Is the same There is no doubt about that Not every kind of magic Is the same and what was done to the Prophet ﷺ had particular effects in certain things, which Sheikh mentioned, like forgetting that he did something, forgetfulness about whether he'd been with his wife or not, things like that. But it didn't lead to other to other uh, things in in himself. And so this word multiple is also important uh, that it's not it's a very specific kind of magic. And this word can be used for sihr, it can also be used for like an illness or not really? Does that not happen in the language? Mm. Any idea? I mean, I haven't come across it being used okay. in that context. So, uh, so according to your position, this is proof that magic does exist because we have a hadith that says that it was done on the Prophet To Allah the Prophet yeah. To the Prophet Okay, I didn't think I would ever say this to you guys, but you're holding the same position as the Quraysh. As Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Furqan, وَقَالِ الظَّالِمُونَ إِن تَتَبِعُونَ إِلَّا رَجُلًا مَسْخُورًا the Dhalimun, the, the wrongdoers, the oppressors, they say that you're only following a man who's just been afflicted with magic. And okay. in another ayah, in Surah Al-Isra, Allah says a similar thing. So both of these ayats indicate, and we know from the Mafum al the opposite understanding, if the wrongdoers and the Dhalimun are saying this, that you're following a man who's been afflicted by magic, it means that the correct position is that he was not afflicted by magic. So does these, do these ayats not make you from the Dhali mean? Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, the response I want to give you is again, we have two evidences seemingly contradicting one another. The right way to go about it is to bring them together and not take one and dismiss the so other. So I would say I've got the words of Allah and I've got the words... Bukhari was a great man, but he was a man and Muslim. No, we have an ayah. So but there's an ayah from the Quran here. And we have an ayah that you brought supposedly seemingly... You know, for the sake of argument, that they're contradicting one another. So the ayah in Surah Al-Falaq doesn't say that this happens to the Prophet. That's important because the ayah that I'm talking about are talking specifically about, about the, the ayah. Has, you know, the ayah doesn't. The ayah comes to a situation. We know the Quran is two types when it comes down. There's a ibtidai and a sababi. Ibtidai means the ayah initially just comes down. Okay, it just you know, it just comes down. And a sababi means it comes down for a particular reason, something that's taking place at that time. And we know about the reason through the So we know that this ayah by consensus of the mufassirin that it's not just sababi, but it's sababu nuzuri li sihri nabi sallallahu alayhi wa I'm still uh, preferring the words of Allah. I'm saying there's a consensus. No, no, you don't open a, a tafsir book. Uh, and you look at the exegesis of the Quran, except that you will tend to, f you will find in every single tafsir book that this is the call which, which only existed, that this ayah came down. But again, my point here is seemingly contradicting. You got one side, and you brought your evidences, we, we can't take that away from you, and we've brought what we've brought. Now, there has to be a way to be bring these two evidences together. We can't take one and leave the other. This is a, 
Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, uh, he mentions categorically and clearly, clearly in the Quran that it's a people who've got sickness in their hearts who tend to just take one verse and abandon the other verse or they will take one hadith and, and turn away from the other hadith. First of all, as a premise, do we agree that the Prophet is a bashar? Yes, he's a he's human, a human being. Yeah. So this gives us that the Prophet he is not immortal. Like he doesn't okay. he dies like we I die. agree with that. Okay. And he's a human being. Many Quraya is in the Quran Inama and a Basharu Mitrukum Yuha Ilaya and Nama Ilahu kum ila wa il inama ilahu kum ilahu wahid. And another ayah Kalat Lahum Rusulhum Afilahi Kalat Rusulum in Nahnu Illa Basharu Mitrukum. We are humans like you. We're just like you, nothing. Number two, and this is where the issue is coming to you from, which is that the, the, the kuffar of Quraysh, they were saying that the Prophet Sallallahu message that he's conveying is a what? Is, is, a, is a magic, is a form of magic. No, I remember, I mean, in the beginning I put premise down. Okay, so it's... It's Kedib and Zur. Okay. They're saying that it's a forged, made up statement of yours. Again, the Quran in discourse, it talks about... They like didn't this. talk about his message in these ayats. No, again, we're saying, even, even if we take on board what you're saying, they're saying that they, he's got magic that's affecting his conveying of the message of Islam. We have clearly now, Sheikh Muhammad has already shown you right now, that the tab is a type of magic that was done to the Prophet. It was a specific thing that was affecting. It was not affecting his message of Islam. It was not affecting his conveying of the religion. They're saying he has magic that is affecting his message. He knew about it straight away, the Prophet when the magic was done to him? Oh, he's telling Aisha that they're lying. Straight away. It's not like there was a period of time where he wasn't aware. This is interesting. Some of the scholars actually mentioned this. And I came across this in, in, in some of the discussion regarding the Prophet that he that from the things here is that he was uh, he he was aware that something wasn't uh, wasn't right and that it wasn't the case that he became completely unaware of everything going on around him and he didn't know whether he had recited an ayah or not recited an ayah. It wasn't like that. It was a very specific issue. And that he was aware that something was not right, but that he wasn't aware of the cause until Allah Azza wa Jal answered his dua and revealed to him what the cause was. Is that correct, Sheikh? Yeah. That's what I've read from some of the statements some of the scholars in this. I think Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, I a quote from Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, when he said, he said, regarding the sihr that was done to the Prophet, النَّاسِ a group of people denied that this could happen. They said this couldn't happen to him. Something like this isn't allowed to happen to him. And they thought that this was a, a, a flaw and something deficient to say about him. And the thing, this situation is not like they imagined it to be. He said, this is just nothing more than what used to happen to the Prophet ﷺ from the sicknesses and illnesses. And it's a type of sickness. And he said, And the fact that he was afflicted by this is the same as him being afflicted by poison. And there is no difference between them. And then he mentioned the hadith. And he mentioned then, and then he said, And he said, يَجُوزُ عَلَيْهِ كَأَنْوَاعِ الْأَمْرَاضِ مِمَّا لَا يُنْكَرْ وَلَا, ولا يَقْتَحُ فِي نُبُوَّتِهِ He said that sihr is a sickness from the sicknesses and it's something that happens from the things that make people unwell and, if, and this is permissible to happen to him like any other sickness which all these sicknesses nobody denies happen to him like he got a fever or he was poisoned or he got he had sicknesses happen to him and this doesn't affect his prophethood Ibn Qayyim continues, he said, as for the fact that he used to see things, that he had done something and he hadn't done it, فَلَيْسَ فِي هَذَا مَا يُدْخَلُ عَلَيْهِ دَاخِلَ فِي شَيْءٍ مِّنْ صِدْقِهِ لِقِيَامِ الدَّلِيلِ وَالْإِجْمَاءِ عَلَىٰ إِسْمَتِهِ مِنْ هَذَا He said, the fact that this, that he did something and then he didn't remember that he had done it, this doesn't affect his truthfulness or his prophethood because there is an evidence and there is consensus that he was protected by Allah Azza wa Jal from anything that would affect his prophethood or his truthfulness. And he said, but this only happened in matters of the dunya, which the Prophet was not sent for in the first place. He was not sent to convey to the people whether he had 
spoken to his wife or not spoken to his wife. This is something that happened to him in the matters of the dunya that wasn't, um, wasn't included in his prophethood to uh, begin with. Nor was he preferred over all of mankind because of this. So this is just, he said, Like all mankind, he, is, he might get sick like anybody else. And that's it. The quote continues from Zaid al Ma'ad. Like, and this is just a simple. Yani, even, even something else he said, Rahimullah, in Bada'i al Fawaid, second volume, Ibn al Qayyim. He says, This is established according to the scholars of the scholar of Hadith. This is fully established. They don't dispute one another in his authenticity. Bukhari and Muslim, both of them agreed upon. Allah to consider it, to consider this hadith to be sahih. وَلَمْ يَتَكَلَّمْ فِيهِ أَحَدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِ الْحَدِيثِ The people of hadith, not one of them spoke about this hadith. بِكَلِمَةٍ وَاحِدَةٍ With one word. We know there were great scholars who actually stood over Bukhari and Muslim. Mm -hmm. From them is Abu Mas'ud al-Dimashqi, al-Dara al-Qutni, Abu Ali al-Jayyani. Um, and none of them. My point none is... None of them actually came to this particular hadith and said, you know what? Because they weakened it. Dara al-Qutni weakened some hadith in Bukhari. Abu Ali al-Jayyani... He weakened some hadith in Bukhari. Al uh, Abu Mas'ud al Dimashqi. These kids, these, these Aima did. But they, didn't, they didn't take it because Bukhari said, oh, Muslim. By the way, Bukhari and Muslim went under scrutiny, okay? They did go under scrutiny. They got checked. They got, look, they got looked at. No one just took it because Bukhari said, my book is Sahih. Why hasn't any one of them, till today, we have not one person we can say are from the Ahlul Nuqad, people we consider people to be from people of hadith, who've actually said a criticism regarding. Uh, this particular hadith. Look what he said. Well, the story is also what? Famous. In the Ahli Tafsiri was Sunan. So it's not issued just for the Ahli Hadith. The Ahli Hadith, they will authenticate this hadith. The people of Tafsir, the scholars who did exegesis on the verse, they unanimously agreed upon it. The Fuqaha, well, he said, look what he said. He said, In the Ahli Tafsiri was Sunani, well, Hadith, what tariqh? He said, well, Fuqaha, even the jurist. And these people know the Prophet's situation better than anyone. And they know the Prophet's days more than who? Min al mutakallimin Than the Mu'tazila and their likes. Who were the furthest from the Sunnah. For the furthest of the, from the Quran. And another point. Abu Muhammad ibn Qutayba mentioned that as well. He's, I don't want to bring a statement because it's a bit long. Al Qadi Iyad. The Shaykh mentioned some of it. Al Hafid ibn Hajar al Asqalaniyu. Al-Allam Abdul Hamid al-Mu'allimi. I draw the Mu'allimi in two places in his books. In his kitab, uh, in his kitab At-Tanqil Bima Fi Ta'nib Al-Kawthari Min Al-Batil, when he was refuting Muhammad Zahid Al-Kawthari, he mentioned it in there. He has another kitab called Al-Anwar Al-Anwar Al-Kashifa, where he was responding to Adwa Al-Sunnah Al-Muhammadiyah by uh, Abu Muhammad Ibn Abu Muhammad Abu Raya. Mu'allimi refuted him there. Abu Abd Al-Rahman Muqbil Ibn Hadi Al-Wadi'i. And I can go on and carry on how many people have all stated this being a true reality that took place. So the Prophet Sallallahu and this magic happened to him, alayhi salatu wasalam. And what you brought regarding Quraysh is specific to, uh, I mean, they were referring to that this man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's, the magic is, is what's making him talk like this. Okay, I'll give you more general verse. Surat Al-Ma'idah, Allah mm -hmm. says, Wallahu ya'asimu ka minan nas. Allah will protect you from the people. And now you're saying that Allah and, was and Allah wrong. Allah protected him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He protected his prophethood, protected his reputation among the people, protected his truthfulness, so that this event was nothing more than a sickness from the sicknesses, as we quote it. It was a, it became to him like a marad mil amrad. Some of the scholars here they mentioned that this magic was done to kill the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And yet the only effect that it had upon the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, was not that he died, not that he became uh, confused in his revelation, not that he changed any aspect of, of prophethood whatsoever, but simply that he became sick, like he became sick from things that are, and like Ibn al-Qayyim said, there is no difference between this and that. And he became sick from many other things. Uh, so here, what we see is that Allah Azza wa Jal protected the Prophet ﷺ. He protected him. However, the reason that this magic happened, here there are some, uh, some points we can make. Either Allah Azza wa Jal wished to show to people the means in which, uh, or, how, or, or so the ruling, some of the rulings related to this, so that they saw how the Prophet behaved and the, the uh, ayah was revealed and the, the, 
the two surahs al falaq and al-Nas and the use of them in, in recitation in order to uh, seek a cure from, from magic uh, and so on. Or this is simply one of the, the things which, any, which uh, w- the Prophet was, uh, any, was uh, touched with like the other sicknesses as we mentioned. And that's exactly what Qadir Iyad said. He said, وَالسِّحْرُ مَرَضُ مِنَ الْأَمْرَاضِ وَعَارِضُ مِنَ الْعِلَلِ يَجُوزُ عَلَيْهِ عَلَيْهِ صَلَى عَلَيْهِ صَلَى عَلَيْهِ صَلَى عَلَيْهِ صَلَى عَلَيْهِ كَأَنْوَاعِ الْأَمْرَاضِ مِمَّا لَا يُنْكَرْ وَلَا يَقْدَحُ فِي نُبُوَّتِهِ وَأَمَّا كَوْنُ يُخَيَّلُ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ فَعَلَ شَيْئًا وَلَمْ يَفْعَلُ فَلَيْسَ فِي هَذَا مَا يُدْخِلُ عَلَيْهِ دَاخِلَةٌ فِي شَيْءٍ مِنْ مِنْ صِدْقِ لِقِيَامِ الدَّلِيلِ وَالْإِجْمَاعِ عَلَى عِصْمَتِهِ مِنْ هَذَا وَإِنَّمَا وَإِنَّمَا هَذَا فِيمَا يَجُوزُ الطُّرُوحُ فيما يجوز طره عليه في أمر دنياه التي لم يبعث لسببها ولا فضل من أجلها وفيها عرضة للآفات كسائل البشر But the Prophet was not honored in worldly affairs He was honored through what? Mm-hmm. So whatever worldly affairs he suffers with the people And is part of what the people are فغير بعيد أن, يخل... أن يخيل إليه من أمرها ما لا حقيقة له ثم ينجلي عنه كما كان when it came to worldly affairs, the Prophet even used to get it right and wrong. When he said to them, Antum after he guided the people in the Nishu, he used, they, and he got it wrong, and he said, okay, you guys know your worldly affairs better. So the Prophet Sallam, when it came to worldly affairs, he was affected. Like in, when it came to his, re, re, his prophecy, this is where Allah promised that he's going to protect him and look after him and make sure that no one and any, nothing harms him. Alayhi salatu, alayhi salatu Let me give you more evidences. I mean, it's okay. important that I give you more evidences. Even that though, the qaida is one evidence is enough for one person, for a person. And if one doesn't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, shahid. If what evidence does it give? If you if you don't find content in one evidence, I don't know if you're gonna accept give me twenty more. or thirty. Give me more, because I'm not content yet. Give me more. Abi Sa'id al Khudri, Abi Sa'id radiyallahu taala anhu. Sorry, Sa'id radiyallahu anhu. He said, I heard the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say, "Man tasabbaha." Anyone who wakes up in the morning with what? Sab'ata maratin. Ajwatan. Ajwa is a Madani date. Mm-hmm. The Madani one is a prophet. The Medina, Ajwa. Seven of them. Lam yadurrahu dhalika al-yawmu summun wa la sihratun. Meaning? No one takes seven Ajwa dates. The Prophet ﷺ says in the morning when he wakes up, he takes those two. No poison, no poison, or magic will affect him. Yeah, this is not just hyperbolized speech. Like if I say, this phone is so good, it's going to make you forget about everything else. That's like, it. The Prophet ﷺ did that, right? He said that a uh, lone traveler is a shaytan. Yeah. Two travelers are shaytan. A, three, a group of three is a, is a traveling group. He doesn't literally mean that they're shaytan. It's just hyperbolized speech. He does this in the sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa Again, too, we bring it back to this point that we mentioned before. Who preceded you in that understanding? Um, Sheikh Muhammad was a bit nice to you. He said he got it from your pocket. I'll say he got it from your back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> the second point is that this is the second. This is very important, and this is the second point, which is that um, the asal of the speech is that we take it literal, unless there's an external evidence that makes it metaphorical or figurative speech. So when the Prophet says something, we always take it literal, unless we find something that we can say, okay, yeah, this is not literal now. It's a figurative. Okay, speech. question. He's the one who's telling the people for this, and Allah says. He's told the people how to protect themselves from magic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he doesn't remember it himself and he gets afflicted by magic. How would you explain what that? A, what about if it was something that he was taught and educated by later? Which the asal mm-hmm. is that the hadith was after this incident. What about the adhkar for adhkar al sabah, adhkar al masa? These things protect you from magic and things like this, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. He forgot to do it that day? Like, what, what are you saying about him? I mean, again, all these are protective. Issues. I mean, uh, there's a side benefit I'm going to mention, and, and Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad can then build on it. There was a man who uh, was one of the leaders of the Khawarij. He was uh, he was called um, Nafi ibn Azarq. Nafi ibn Azarq, the Azariqa. That's the, you know the Azariqa was a group of the Khawarij. Okay. and Azariqa. They had different names that they were given. And this man, he one day sat in the Tafsir class of uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas. And Abdullah ibn Abbas was talking about the hoot hoot. Abdullah ibn Abbas, and he said that the hoot hoot, when it flies over the air, it can actually see down on the earth of the floor, uh, the, uh, on the earth, the hoot hoot can actually see what's underneath the earth. Abdullah ibn Abbas said this. Like when it looks down, it can actually see, it can actually see the jewels and the things that are in the earth. It can actually see it from the top. Nafi ibn Azraqin came and he thought, today I am going to show Ibn Abbas. Because he used to always, uh, always argue with Ibn Abbas. 
But like some scholars, they said, if he stopped arguing with him, stopped arguing with Ibn Abbas, and he just took knowledge from him, he would have benefited a lot. But Ibn Abbas locked off teaching him because of his argumentation. So he said, today I'm going to get Ibn Abbas and I'm going to prove him <laughs> that what he's talking about is nonsense. So he came to Ibn Abbas after the tafsir and he said to him, look, um, you said that right. Yeah. Why is it that we see the little children in, in Medina? Place grass on the earth. Hutud comes in and it goes in it and it falls in. And they lock it and they play around with it later on the streets of Medina. And then Ibn Abbas said, إِذَا جَاءَ الْقَدَرُ بَطَلَ الْحَذَرُ the qadr comes however much precautions you take that doesn't mean that it doesn't work it works but the qadr has now come لذلك even the ayah لَهُ مُعَقِّبَاتٌ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ يَحْفَظُونَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِ اللَّهِ that there is an angel protecting the person from the front and the back on the side some of the scholars they said that the person is protected فَإِذَا جَاءَ الْقَدْر when the qadr comes down those angels move away What's the, what's, the team, what's the point of even doing the adhkar then if mm. this is just going to be good? So there is no doubt that we are first of all from the sunnah, uh, from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is that we perform adhkar and that these adhkar protect a person. Uh, however, there's no doubt also that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was sent down as an example. Now here, uh, the scholars have uh, some points that they mentioned regarding the issue that you said. First of all. Uh, Ibn Hajar uh, ta'ala, and others they mentioned this that here if the shaitan the shaitan had a plot to harm the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this plot with Labid ibn al-Asam through the means of magic however this plot was not successful and therefore first of all uh, this issue that the adhkar didn't work for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here is also not clear since if this is a plot of the shaitan to cause this harm to the Prophet and didn't work, therefore this is a means by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. Or that Allah Azza wa Jal, and this is close to the point that the Shaykh said here, Allah Azza wa Jal wished to show, and this is also mentioned, Tibi uh, and others mentioned it, that the Prophet here was to it was to show that he is a human being and that things happen to him as happened to other human beings. And that has a greater purpose than this simply, you know, this idea that if you're just, you know, you're doing the adhkar and then that's it, nothing will ever happen to you. So sometimes a person may do their adhkar in the morning and something may happen to them. But that thing that happens to them has a greater benefit to them in the long run or a greater purpose to it or a greater wisdom to it. That, uh, as the Sheikh mentioned with regard to the angels, that, the angel, that when the, the decree of Allah descends, the angels move out of the way. So... Mm. Here I don't see that there is no point in doing the adhkar. The adhkar protect you from so many harms. Not just the harms of magic. The adhkar are not just there to protect you from magic, to protect you from all kinds of harms. But that doesn't stop things happening to you from time to time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, wisdom for. And again, the issue of whether the adhkar came after, whether these adhkar specific to this came after the incident, that's another a separate issue. Yeah. And uh, there's another benefit, inshallah, that, that can be added here is that Ibn al-Qayyim has a kitab called Da'wah al-Dawa, right? Yeah. Where he talks about the uh, the illnesses and its cures. And in the early b- b- beginning pages, um, he talks about the concept of dua. Because it's an illness that came, so he mentions the concept of dua, and that there's no illness that comes down except that the dua, uh, you know, there, sorry, there's no illness that comes except there is a cure for it. The one who knows it knows it, and the one who doesn't know it doesn't know it. And then he mentions the concept of dua bin from those things. And then he said something very powerful. He said dua is like a sword. Okay. He said the sword can slice someone, but it's depending on who grabs that sword. The person who's going to use it. And if he knows how to use it properly. So these things that the, the sharia are mentioned are effective in and within itself. But it's always dependent on the person. Like what type of since has he fallen into like رَجُلٌ يُطِيلُ السَّفَرَ أَشْعَةَ أَغْبَرَ يَمُدُّ يَدَيْهِ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ يَا رَبِّ يَا رَبِّ وَمَطْعَمُ حَرَامُ وَمَلْبَسُ حَرَامُ وَغُذِيَ بِالْحَرَامُ فَأَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ لِذَلِكِ This man, he made dua. Are we going to say dua? Allah doesn't accept it. And وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبُ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانُ If my slave asks me, I am close. 
Allah didn't say to them, فَقُلْ لَهُمْ إِنِّي قَرِيبِ He didn't make a th- He didn't put the prophet between us and him. Like he spoke to us directly. فَإِنِّي قَرِيبِ I'm close to you. Generally, Allah used the word قُلْ Say to them, Muhammad. And, but here, when it came to the dua, Allah spoke to us directly. So that means that the relationship between the slave and Allah Azawajal when it comes to dua is direct. So the point here is, the dua is a silah al-mu'min, even, if, even, even though the hadith is not sahih. Like, إِنَّ الْمَعْنَاهُ صَحِحْ The meaning is correct. That the dua is the weapon of the believer. But then again, the weapon, it needs someone who knows how to use it. So Ibn al-Qayyim said that the person has to have a strong forearm. He mentions all of this. And knows how to use the sword. Um, also, the blade can, can weaken in, 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 in one hand and not in another hand. So again, uh, we won't belittle the du'a and the adhkar and the ajwa dates and all these things. They are a means. They are all means. And we don't depend on the means alone. We always believe that the means can happen. And it may even sometimes, ta'tilu al-asbab can happen. Allah can actually stop the means of happening. I mean, we know things that have the means of harming people. And it, we know it hasn't harmed people. Like Nabi Allah, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, the fire lost its power to burn uh, fire can burn we, we won't say to people go throw yourselves into fires but it happened that Allah ta'ala took from the fire the ability to burn Nabi Allah Ibrahim you know so magic they, can't happen except with the permission of Allah is that what you shak, we say that we do say that if Allah yeah. wills it to happen it will happen if Allah well, doesn't no, will it to happen but with regard to the Prophet here the situation is uh, no doubt slightly different because yeah. here it's not we're not talking about the issue of uh, of n- n- the adhkar being effective we're talking about uh, as we said one of uh, two key things either that this is uh, something for which that there was a plot of the shaitan and the adhkar were effective and this is the sign that the adhkar were effective and also when we talk about you know I thought there's something very profound in the hadith the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha that I, I, I forgot to mention earlier and I wanted to mention it is that we talk about how the Prophet like some new, uh, di- didn't know what was happening or that he had things that he did that he didn't remember and yet when those two men uh, stood at one at his head and one at his feet he saw Allah like, was able to perceive it completely and he never had a time where he, he wasn't blocked from him being able to perceive that and being able to know the answer so in reality Allah did protect him and the adhkar did the adhkar were effective for him sallallahu alaihi wasallam but he went through an experience which that experience was designed to show us how to behave in, in that situation and to give us uh, rulings and examples that come out from that so that also doesn't contradict this concept uh, that the, the prophet sallallahu alaihi was protected or that the adhkar protect a, a muslim so the, so the benefit of showing us that the Prophet Sallallahu was a human being is, a re- is one of the, maybe one of the reasons why this affects him to a certain extent but that benefit would not have been there if it affected his revelation which is why Allah didn't allow it to go beyond a certain extent No doubt okay. even, even Subhanallah Wallahi, one of the th- benefits that I took from the seerah was some of the Aymat uh, seerah they mentioned that the battle of Uhud you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam his tooth broken and the wajnah that the Prophet was wearing, the helmet, he went into his jaw, alayhi salatu wasalam. Mm. And the scholars, some of them, they said, wallahi, a profound statement. They said that this was an indication that the only one who is the one whose face will not be harmed, who can never be put through suffering and pain is Allah. Azza wa Jalla. That makes sense. You know, this is the Prophet of Allah. He went through all of this. We, as Muslims, the religion that was right before us, the prophet that was right before our prophet. By the way, prophets had you know m- many prophets in between them. Like in the, the prophets that we know generally, there are many other prophets between them. Yeah. Like in Nabi Muhammad and Isa ibn Maryam were right after each other. And the prophet before Nabi Muhammad, they moved him away from Basharia, being a human. Right, I see. They made him into something. You know, uh, the prophet even mentioned in many authentic hadiths, لا تطروني كما أطرت النصارى عيسى بن مريم. Don't go overboard with me like the Christians went overboard with Isa ibn Maryam. So these verses and these ahadiths actually show us that the Prophet, after all, he's a, he's a bashar, he's a human being. Uh, but he's not an ordinary bashar, by the way. He's a prophet sent from Allah. So um, so we say, Nabiyun, uh, we say, Abdun fala yu'bat. He's a slave, we don't worship him. Wa Nabiyun fala yu'sa. And he's a prophet, we don't disobey him. Okay. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so a question for you guys then. So we're talking about magic being kufr. 
And now we have certain prophets, like the Prophet وسلم, spitting the moon, or Musa السلام, parting the Red Sea. Is this not a form of magic? And therefore, are we now saying that the prophets are committing acts of kufr? How do you explain that? Okay. A point that I want to put out there clearly, inshallah ta'ala, and then I'm going to go into your answer properly, which is that, first of all, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that he was a prophet son from Allah azza wa jalla, and he said, Ana nabiyun la kadhib. I'm a prophet, I am not lying. There were people around him who saw him. Those people, from them were businessmen, uqala, they were leaders of their people, respected you know, chief members, all these people saw the Prophet. People who could distinguish. People live in the heart, one of the hardest lands in, in the world, one of the hardest, in the middle of the desert, know how to survive. People like that are the audience of the Prophet. ﷺ. Those now, a lot of them became his companions and his and his followers. All of them. Without any exception. Like one companion, if you bring me. Then I say this is a good dialogue today that we're having a good discussion of this issue and it has you've got a you've got a strong argument. But we have not one companion ever saying that there's no magic. Not one companion. It's very important because these are the people Allah told us in the Quran was Rather, I'll tell you this. Sahaba to Rasulillah and the students of the Prophet's companions, which are called the Tabi'een. And the Tabi'u Tabi'in, which are the students of the students of the companions, none of them have said anything that alludes or even slightly indicates that there's no such thing as magic. Do you know why? The, the first people who actually said, the first people that this statement came out of their mouth, the first group of people were the Qadriya. And the Mu'tazila are Qadriya in, in, the, in, the, in the issue of Qadr. The first people. So it's, it's worrying when your statement goes right back to a group like that. You, you kind of have to say to yourself, whoa, this is, this, is this the kind of people I have? have? Have you got statements from the companions where they say that a uh, red unicorn with seven horns doesn't exist? None of them said it. No, I'm saying I've got... I've got no, no, this is important, it's important. But that red unicorn isn't mentioned in the Quran, is it? Yeah, this is, so a, this is something so that's... So do we have statements that are, are from the companions affirming magic? No, first of all, magic is something that's stated in the Quran, stated in the Sunnah. We have them affirming it. And then we, we don't have any of those reject. I mean, if one companion affirms something and another companion doesn't genuinely believe it, it's not going to happen from within the companions that they will not come and say, I don't agree with you. We have Sahabas correcting each other. Zarqashi has a kitab, uh, Aisha correcting some of the companions, you know, saying that Fulan is wrong by saying the statement. Like sahabas never let each other say things which they genuinely didn't agree with. So we don't have any companion rejecting the statements of those who are affirming it. Even Abbas's statement, we have a Bakr statement, Umar radiallahu statement. None of them have been rejected here. They, these people were affirmed it. Okay. So this is an issue that has to be put out there now. Okay. Um, now coming back to the question that you asked, the Prophet is splitting the moon, alayhi salatu wasalam, and the concept of magic. Now, they two both have something in common and they've got many that they differ in. The first one is that these both are outside the norms. Okay. So this is the point that you're trying to, I think, yeah. try to use. Now I'm going to give you the difference between what the prophets came with and that which the magicians come with and the difference between the two. One is referred to as a mu'jiza. It's an evidence for the prophet's prophecy. It's mu'jiza. And another one is called magic. I'm going to give you some, exa- some things that make the difference between a mu'jiza and sihr. So you can then say, wow, okay, they're, they're actually not the same. Number one, mu'jiza remains years after that prophet. I'm a decades, I'm a centuries, I'm a lifetime. After that prophet has gone, this still stands. It still remains. It doesn't stop. Okay? Whereas magic, as soon as it happens, it doesn't stay. It just goes. The effect of it doesn't stay. Okay, it doesn't mean it doesn't it doesn't remain. So the moon is still split. So, for example, the mu'jizah that we have right now, no, that's just one magic. That's one just one mu'jizah. Okay. Another well, our biggest mu'jizah is the Quran. The Quran is outside the norms. You have to understand that it's not your ordinary speech. So it's gonna it's gonna remain. It stays even though the prophet's gone. The reason why the mu'jizah is connected to Allah Azza wa Jalla, whereas this is connected to the person who's done it. So when they go out of the picture, 
then the magic goes with them. Number two, and المعجزة يظهرها صاحبه على رؤوس الأشهاد. The magic is done in the presence of people, in an audience. Point number two, معجزة is done in the presence of all people. Like a person who's doing معجزة will do it in, in front of everybody. The wise, the smart, the clever, the intellectual, the uh, the ac- academics, the every here is. What do you guys have to say about this? Whereas the magicians, they do it in front of بين الجهلة والضعفاء ضعفاء العقول عادة. They do it in front of people who can quickly believe in them. Dimwitted people, lame man. That's what they do it to. Number three. أن المعجزة تجد لها قبولا وصدا حسنا في النفوس المؤمنة. معجزة receives acceptance by people who naturally are good people. They accept it. It goes in line with they accept it uh, without arrogance. And this increases their, of course, their determination and belief in it. As for mag- magic, you generally see the people who accept it are what? Again, ignorant people and the weak people are genuinely the ones. Are you talking about accepting the reality of magic? Or what do no, you no, accepting the, uh, what, what just came from that magic that was done. And as whether it's a miracle or not. As, okay. be, as whether it's from, from Allah or not. Yeah. I mean, a, a person will see right through it and say, yeah, yeah this is... This I see what you mean. La I see what you mean. Okay. This is, does not seem real. Okay. Yeah. Number four. Mu'jizah always bringing good for the people. So when it comes, it brings good. Um, whereas magic, on the other hand, it always brings harm. It always brings oppression in place. Evil. You always see that something evil is being done to the community. Someone's suffering now. Look at how they're sick. They're all of... And Mu'ajiz doesn't do that to people. Rather, Mu'ajiz strengthens a person's lifestyle. It makes them better and good. Number five. A magician, you can actually repel his evil with, a, with the same thing he did. If you do it as well, it will repel it. And you can get rid of it straight away. Whereas Allah's ayat, you are never able to get rid of it. It will stay. It has an effect. It will not be move, easily be removed. What well, Sheikh Al-Sam Taymi said, الفرق بين النبي وبين الساحر. The difference between a prophet and a magician and a person who's crazy. أعظم من الفرق بين العاقل والمجنون والعالم والجاهل. is far different from the difference between an ignorant person and a person of knowledge. And a person who's sane and a person who's insane. The way you can determine who's sane and who's insane. And the one who's knowledgeable and knows and the one who's ignorant. It's that clear to tell the difference between a prophet and a magician. And I think also, there's a very, very practical example. If when we look at what happened between Musa and between the magicians. Because here on one side we have Sihr and on the other side we have a Mu'jiz. Compete, <coughs> competing with each other. In a single time. So the magicians, when they threw down their staffs and they became like snakes, Musa felt fear in, his, in himself. He said, Do not fear, you will be the one who is superior. Throw down what is in your right hand, it will destroy, eat up everything that they did. The only thing they did is Kaidu Sahih. So, what did Musa do? If the only thing they did is Kaidu Sahih, then what Musa did was a mu'jiza, a miracle. And that magician will never be successful. Whatever he comes, whatever he does, wherever he is, and whatever he tries to do, he'll never be successful ultimately. And so, فَأُلْقِيَ السَّحَرَةُ سُجَّدَةُ The magicians themselves fell down in prostration when they saw that what Musa had was not magic. It was a miracle from Allah Azza wa قَالُوا آمَنَّا بِرَبِّ هَارُونَ وَمُوسَى They said, we believe in the Lord of Harun and Musa. This is the clearest difference between a mu'jizah and between sihr. And even if you look at the beginning of the issue between um, Nabi Allah Musa and the Sahara, the magicians, you find that the the, who they are both connected to is different. The magicians, when they started, they looked at Fir'aun and they said, Do we get some reward from you? Are you going to recognize us uh, if we win this and we bring home victory? Whereas Nabi Lahi Musa, 
his relationship with his, is with who? Uh, Allah. That's, that's clear. So the magician is always going to talk about makhluqat, uh, creations. Whereas the Nabi and the one who's upon the Prophet's way is always mentioning Allah, Allah, Allah. That, that's one of the biggest signs. Number two that you tell from them is the way that the Prophet Musa alayhi salam, alayhi salam, was firm on what he was upon. And how they quickly turned away from it. And as soon as they took what the Prophet came with, they were firm as well. When he scared them and he said to them, uh, and you know, I'm going to cut your legs and your hands and I'm going to do this and this and this to you guys. Their response was, you know, there's no harm. Do what you wish. We're going to go back to our Lord. They're talking about their relationship with Allah already. So, as Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned in the Kitab al Nubuwat that I just stated, it's so clear when you really look at it, the one who is connected to Allah and the one who is a, a prophet, and a magician, it's like between day and night to really distinguish it. But I want to say something again. Last point I want to mention here is sure. that you resorted to an adilla aqliya now. What you just used right now was a rational argument. And you're trying to use it in an, in an issue of the ghaybiyah, the unseen. And this is generally common amongst the people. They tend to fall into this mistake. Is that you're trying to use an evidence, a rational evidence in an issue of the unseen. You're trying to say, logically, it doesn't make sense that this man is doing khawariq al and this is when this person is doing khawariq al They're do both doing things out of the norms. It doesn't make sense then which one is right and which one is wrong. This, again, shows that adil al is the first way to prove things. And now we've shown it that rationally it makes sense that magic can happen. Um, it's an illness from the illnesses out there. Yeah. Prophets can go through illnesses. The prophet can have a hay fever. He can have a headache. He can get sick. It doesn't have. The prophet can become tired and he can become fatigued. And sometimes, even when you are tired and you are fatigued, you generally do feel lack focus is not there, but doesn't affect a person's. Okay, I think that's been a, a fascinating discussion. Um, I've really thrown everything at you guys from front pockets and back pockets, and I think um, what I'd like to do now, just before we close the episode, that's all we have time for. It's just to give a summary, Sheikh Tim, of uh, the kind of stuff that we've discussed today. Okay. So the very first thing that we said is that magic is something which is established and mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah and by the consensus of Ahl Sunnah. It's something real, which has many different branches and different forms and affects people in many different ways. It's a type of knowledge which people learn and that knowledge ha causes very real effects among people. And most importantly, there isn't anything good in it. There is no white magic, there's no good magic, there's no beneficial magic. It's something that brings evil, it brings destruction, it brings separation. Even when people try to use it for good, it brings about their own destruction and the destruction of others. We've learned that this is something which Islam and indeed all of the nations that preceded or the vast majority of the nations that preceded uh, the Muslims were also in agreement that this is something evil and something which brings about evil and destruction within the community and it's from the plots of the shaitan and the means by which and indeed from the things which the shaitan loves the most to cause for, for magic to cause these kind of issues and separation between a husband and his wife for example is something that we need to protect ourselves against and it's something that it happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but Allah Azza wa Jal protected him and kept him safe and gave him a cure and informed him about where he came from and we, not having that guarantee of protection from Allah Azza wa Jal, we need to do what we've been told within the Sharia to protect ourselves. We need to be care cautious with our adhkar and so on, and the means of protection that we have. And most importantly, if something like this does afflict a person, that they go through the proper Islamic process of seeking a cure from Allah, and not that they go to another magician in order to remove magic that was done to them. Jazakumullah khair and to both of you for joining me once again on the Hot Seat Podcast. Join me again next time where I'm going to have both speakers with me and we're going to be talking about evil eye and ruqya, inshallah. Until then, fi amanillahi wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.